everybody, this is James the Bowen, discovering dedicated to Aboriginal peoples as always. And today we've got a special guest on, Professor Hakim Adi. How are you doing, my brother? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Great, great. Great to have you on. You know, we heard a lot about you. Um, very interested in, in your work, plus um, your books, that you, your last book that you, you, you had out that came out last September, uh, dealing with um, African heritage of the Caribbean. Well, well, Caribbean people. If you can give give us a little bit more of an insight, I'm going to te- I'm going to tell you what it's about because it sounds like you don't know what it's about. I just see the glimpse of it. it. That's it. African and Caribbean people in Britain. That's it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. I, I need to actually get into the book, get on the book myself. You know. So great to have you on, and um, also there's also um, things there which ca- caught me really about you being fired for teaching. African studies. African history, yeah. African history, of history. Africa, history of Africa and the African diaspora, yeah. Right. So, well, I don't know where to actually begin because, I mean, that really caught me seriously because I know that the same parts in America and probably the UK as well where they're trying to ban African history being taught. Mm-hmm. So if you give us a little introduction to yourself, where did it all begin for you? Oh, wow. You want me to go back that far? That's a long, long time ago. Yeah, um, just briefly just give us, like, just so we can have a starting point and then okay. you know, jump through. Okay. Well, as I explained, or you explained earlier, I was the first person of African heritage to become a history professor or professor of history in Britain. That was in 2015. Um, and my last job was as professor of the history of Africa and the African diaspora at the University of Chichester in Sussex. Um, and I had been working there since 2012, so that's what 11 years ago. So, in the course of those 11 years, I set up a master's degree in the history of Africa and the African diaspora. And that was especially set up for for black students, really. Um, It came out of a a conference that we held in London in 2015 called the History Matters Conference. And that conference was called to discuss why there were so few young black people studying history in this country. I don't know whether you know that um, at university, history is the third least popular subject or the third most unpopular subject young amongst young black students only agriculture and veterinary science are more unpopular than history now as you know if you go to anywhere birmingham liverpool manchester london a community level history is one of the most popular things everybody's interested in history and there's all kind of things going on and so on but amongst young people they're actually been put off studying history not just at university but also at school level so we held a conference to kind of discuss that and to find out exactly why and uh, there were no big surprises but the main thing that young people said was that the history that they were being taught is eurocentric and therefore they don't really want to study it and so on so the conference discussed all this and then it made various recommendations and one of the recommendations was to set up a program for mature students older people who loved history but had been put off history at school or earlier in their life but wanted to come back to history wanted to do some research wanted to research into their families or their communities or whatever whatever so we set up that course in 20 first started in 2018 we've run it for uh, for five years In that time, we've produced, I think, seven of those students have graduated, have gone on to do PhDs, six of them at the University of Chichester and so on. So it was a very um, successful course in the sense that it did what it said on the tin. You know, it gave people the training, the uh, knowledge, the experience to go on and do other studies and so on. Um, And then this year, the university said it was going to close it down. They said there weren't enough students on it and all all kind of other things were said. That course was suspended in in May. 
then the university used that suspension to sack me in August. And right. so we have a situation at the moment where all the students that I was teaching, there's 16 black postgraduate students, the biggest cohort of black postgraduate history students in Britain, have been left without any supervision, their studies disrupted, they don't know whether they're, they're in complete limbo and so on. So that's basically the situation that we're in. At the same time, um, anyway, there are lots of other problems connected, but that's the that's the essence of um, the situation we're in. So just to, to explain a little bit about myself, I said I was the first person of African heritage and so on to become a history professor. I've been teaching history for uh, 30, nearly 40 years, something wow. like that. Um, Quite a while. Yeah. Quite a while. Yeah, a few yeah. years. Interesting. Now, um, when you've been in London, and I'm sure you've been to, you visited Liverpool, I'm sure, many times, or um, I don't know. I was background. in Liverpool two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. So now, from what made you being born in Liverpool, and um, with I'm like yourself with African Nigerian heritage, so it's a little different to someone who just had died, just only Caribbean heritage, because we were taught who we were basically, not who we became. So this is a very this is so we can have more of an open mind discussion on these topics because. Just like we said, I said to you before, uh, what is your tribe when you said Nigeria? You didn't actually subscribe to tribe, even though you said you're Yoruba. Now, I'm aware of me, I'm told from young, you're told from young about these things. Now, I have to be in agreement with you about uh, the tribe thing, because it can cause divide. Now, I just seen it as a geographical area and a customs and culture but if you go back far enough, you'll see that there wasn't as many tribes. You'll see that, you know, we're going back to a common language, a common culture. So, and we have a common enemy, <laughs> number one. <laughs> so, what's your view on tribes and the views? I'd like to hear from your perspective of, of this. Well, the first thing is, what is a tribe, you see? Because when you start talking about tribes, these are the words that uh, the, you know, the colonial rulers brought to Africa. They don't, yeah. You don't call the English a tribe, or the Scottish right. a tribe, or the French yeah. a tribe, or the Germans a tribe. So yeah. why do you call people in Africa tribes? So that's the first thing. So I don't use that word. Okay. The same words that we use to refer to anybody else in the world, we talk about nations of people. The English are a nation. The Palestinians are a nation. Yeah. The French are a nation. The Yoruba are a nation. The Ijo are a nation. The Hausa are a nation. The Igbo are a nation. The Zulu are a nation. These are nations. And the key thing about nations is they have nations have rights. Yeah. They have the right to determine their own affairs. They have the right to sovereignty and so on and so forth. And one of the reasons why those the word nation was denied to Africans was to and is denied to other people is to deny people their rights. And that denial of rights continues in Africa today, even though there's, you know, governments of Africans existing in Nigeria or Ethiopia or wherever it might be. So that's to me very, very important that we don't discriminate against Africans. And we use terms that, as you say, mean the same thing. People have common language, common culture, common land. Okay, they're a nation. They have rights. And one of the yeah. rights is to determine their own affairs, to govern themselves, and so on. To be educated in their own language, and so on. So these are very important questions. So anyway, that's how I would see it. Great, great explanation. Because, um, like you're saying, if what's being put on from the colonizer, they, they're going to do things for their benefit. It's never that our best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Now, what's interesting, like I say, being in Liverpool, I've seen a lot of things uh, focused on the slave trade. This is what I've seen. Besides the basic knowledge I got from my family of Nigerian descent, it was very basic. It wasn't like from reading books or like it was just quite basic. 
So then when I started researching myself as I got older, after watching things like Roots and stuff like that, I started seeing how all these great African empires looking into Nigeria, they had the not culture, you know, Nile Valley civilizations. So it's it's another thing that uh, with I understand how important this, the slave trade is for them to speak on it, you know, reparations behind it, and reparation for in Africa as well. Mm -hmm. um, my focus was trying to focus on the great things that we did. And we still do great things. There's still great things we did during the transatlantic slave trade, even when we landed in different places, black inventions and etc. So yeah. where was your focus on in the beginning? Because obviously, was you dealing with the transatlantic slave trade? Were you dealing with colonialism? Where was the area of your research? And I'm sure that you're definitely aware of other things as well. Well, my area, when I, uh, when I did my PhD a long, long time ago, I focused on anti-colonialism. Yeah. And I focused on Africans in Britain, so particularly in the 20th century. So I looked at African organizations, African anti-colonial organizations in Britain. So uh, and many of those were like student organizations. So West African Students Union being one, Union of Students of African Descent, Nigerian Progress Union, as well as various Pan-African organizations. So going back, the African Association, uh, the Pan-African Federation, the Committee of African Organizations, organizations that were national organizations. So I was really looking at the kind of anti-colonial and anti-racist activity of people in Britain, Africans in Britain, and how that connected with the anti-colonial struggle or the Pan-African struggle within Africa itself. So that's that's where I started. But obviously... Over the years, I've looked at um, other things, and the, the latest book looks at British history going back, you know, 10,000 years, right up till 2020. Interesting. And in my teaching, I've taught all kinds of things, uh, yeah, mainly focusing on colonialism, anti-colonialism, pan-Africanism, uh, yeah, those kind of things. But also, yeah, I mean, I deal with slavery, anti-slavery, everything. Everything related to Africa and the diaspora, I try and... Obviously, no, I don't, don't no. know about everything in general, but I try and deal with everything. Yeah. Well, it's funny when you said Britain, you're dealing with from 10,000 years ago also, because that reminds me of uh, Cheddarman. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've heard of Cheddarman. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> so, what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's great that you start from that time, because, mm -hmm. you know... I mean, I'm not sure, like maybe 20 years ago, with Cheddar Man considered as a Euro white European until they got better with uh, the technology and stuff like that. Excellent. Yeah. And then, wow. Now, when you go from there and you get to Stonehenge, mm -hmm. um, now we have, we have references that Stonehenge could have been built by black people or they were possibly the same culture as the people from Cheddar Man's um, past. Mm -hmm. where, where have you, what have you came up with there uh, with Stonehenge? Um, you're connected to other civilizations, black civilizations? No, I haven't come up any, with anything with Stonehenge. Cer certainly, uh, Cheddar Man, Cheddar Man lived yeah, about 10,000 years ago. And yeah. at, that, at that time, everybody in Britain, everybody in Europe would have looked like Cheddar Man. So they would have been dark skinned, dark haired. And blue eyed for some particular <laughs> reason. That was but I don't know. I, I don't have any particular information about Stonehenge or what it's. Yeah. So, so now when we get like, we get more closer to in the last, because uh, starting from 10,000 years and then running down to Stonehenge. And then as we're coming more into, I don't know where your best research is in, in the last couple of hundred years, or where would you go after like Stonehenge from your research? Well, I mean, the book looks at the, uh, the kind of most ancient findings of Africans in Britain, which, I mean, there's some indication that there could have been people from Africa, you know, more than 2,000 yeah. years ago. But the ones that we have the best information about are, you know, during Roman times. Interesting. When, that's yeah. about nearly 2,000 years ago. Because there we have 
archaeological it's it's all archaeological information really like you say dna analysis yeah. of people so people like uh uh the person who's called ivory bangle lady who died in york a young african woman yeah. there are others buried in different places who she was the lady with all that jewelry buried with yeah the ivory that's what yeah, she's yeah, called yeah. <laughs> yeah. buried with various jewelry including an ivory bangle but we know that there were others in London and other cities, and there were people like Septimius Severus, who was a Roman emperor, who came from Libya, Quintus Lollicus Urbicus, who was a governor of Britain from what is today Algeria, and they brought with them African soldiers, African potters, and as Ivory Bangor Lady and others shows, African women, African children were here in Roman times, and then the archaeological evidence shows us that in the next few centuries, a similar kind of picture. We don't have a lot of evidence, all the evidence yet, because it hasn't all been analysed. But every so often, somebody is, some skeleton is found and analysed. There was an analysis uh, done a few months ago, or published a few months ago, of a young girl who was found not far from where I live in Kent, from the 7th century. 7th century. Yeah, 7th century of our era, so that's 1,300 years ago. And the DNA analysis said that she's of Yoruba origin, just by coincidence. Wow. Um, but the, anyway, they, they reckon they can bring the DNA to a particular location. Wow. What, why, what she was doing in East Kent, whether she actually came from West Africa, more likely her father or grandfather came, yeah, but yeah. she he died at an early age. So there are these kinds of findings dotted around. And what really is needed is people to do more research in the, that very ancient period. Because if you look in the book, my book, that these are the things that I present. Excellent. And we have all this kind of evidence until about 1500. And after 1500, then we have a lot of evidence. We have pictures, we have all kinds of things that we know about. We have records and so on. Um, so then after that period, the evidence is much more. Now, this is all in your most recent book, is it? It's all there. Yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, excellent. I'm looking forward to reading that anyway. I'll share that book out. See, this is yeah. the kind of information what people need. You know, It's not only do I present the information, I present the references of where that information came from. So Excellent. everybody can look for themselves, find all the information, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether you agree, whether you disagree, and so on. Because some people like to, uh, not very many people, but there are some people who attack my book and say it's, you know. Yeah, yeah, well. Lying and this and that. Well, all well, the I information. Think, I think we're used to that though, aren't we? <laughs> you know, we're used to people. Having the tax on us, you know, look at ancient yeah. Egypt, you know, they're still trying to say that these were Eurocentric, Euro, European yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even like, I've just not come back from Egypt and some of the Arabs want to believe they had something to do with it. It was, and they weren't even there, Johnny come lately. So we need um, all the evidence we can find and we need all the researchers that can take part. And researchers of all people, anyone who's going to be honest, honesty is what we need. Yeah, and yeah. that's why why the closing down of this course I mentioned before and the um, the impact that it's had is so so bad because um, it's not just the students who currently exist; it's the students that could exist in the future and have been prevented from existing because that was the only course of its kind in the country in Europe. In fact, only course of that kind, and that's been been closed. So. It's a big problem. Yeah, I know during the time of the Romans uh, period and they came to Britain and they actually writ accounts of, I was speaking to Ron Walker and he documented his book and he mentioned about uh, there was a white red headed race and he was also a black curly haired race. Mm -hmm. And the black curly haired one lived on the coast of Britain. So I was quite interested to know about this. Now, this would have been before the Romans actually came. That's what their account of the writ about. So I thought that was interesting. And then, like you say, we could go back even further than that. You know, mm -hmm. so we start from Cheddar Man, usually in order for us to speak about the Black Prince. Yeah. 
So I thought this was interesting. Um, and not just only Britain, you know, we can look at many places in Europe to Asia. You know, um, I had a person on the show, one of my grandmaster teachers, he passed away about two, far, uh, two years ago, Dr. Renaud Rashidi. Mm-hmm. Now we deal with the African global African presence around the world. He travels mm-hmm. about 125 countries in search. So a lot of um, in his works, he's referenced about Africans given Asians, mm-hmm. tending to Asian civilizations of Indus Valley, the Shang Dynasty of China, the mm-hmm. Persians, Elamites. Um, and even like we can go to look at, we don't even have to go that f- too far back at times, do we as well, where we can look at um, the Arabian P- Peninsula. Mm-hmm. where we can see people of Kushite uh, descendants there. We can look mm-hmm. at the linguistics, like they use the term Asiatic linguistic, the language. Now, speaking to Robin Walker, he said, we need to take the Asiatic part of it because it's an African language that preceded the Semitic, and Semitic would have been a branch of the Afro-Asiatic, what they call it. Yeah, they're basically languages that are similar to languages we find in Ethiopia today. So yeah. those ancient languages are the the parent languages of languages like Arabic and Hebrew and so on. Yeah. Now, what, what's interesting you think about of, this? You think of humanity first emerging in Africa, then yeah, that just takes care of all of that, really. Where do you find from your research from the beginning? When I say the beginning, I mean we probably did in the last hundred and fifty years or into where they've been able to try to write our history off in set whether it was ancient Egypt, whether it was dealing with um, Arabia, it, just dealing with a lot of places where they've been able to write our history off. Well, yeah, but the key thing is that the history is written off in Britain. That's the main thing I'm concerned about. At the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. Um, that's a big problem. The fact that, um, you know, this the history of, Africans or African and Caribbean people in Britain is written off, is yeah. uh, closed down, is not presented in schools and universities and so on. That's a big problem. And then we have those who want to make myths about 1948 and everything started in 1948 with some ship arriving and all this kind of nonsense. Yeah. That's very problematic. Of course, if people want to celebrate a ship arriving, that's fine. That's their business. Yeah. But you you can't present the whole history as being based around a ship coming from a particular place and so on. So those distortions are, um, you know, are very, very serious and uh, just as, you know, just as dangerous as the distortions about ancient Egypt or ancient African history or any other aspect of history. The key thing is to present the, the facts and to present the evidence, and then people can draw their own conclusions. So that's uh, that's what's important about history: that we have the facts and the evidence at our disposal, and we can draw the important, the the, the, the appropriate conclusions from that. And so the denial of that is something that has to be, you know, fought against. And uh, yeah, and it's a big fight. Would you say in um well I know I wouldn't really go so much far as Egypt but like I'd say most of the parts of Africa sub-Saharan Africa West Africa Central Africa do you, do you think that there's a lack of funding in archaeological and anthropological you know our, our our own people bring them back our own history because I know we could go museums in these countries you know we can speak to people but i feel like that africa really needs to bring the history out more stronger not just from an american perspective black americans or not just people from europe people in africa themselves well part of the problem is people don't really study history you know a lot of places people don't yeah. really study history after the age of about 14 whether in wow. Africa or the Caribbean or anywhere, that's a bit of a problem. The history is not problem. really taught. Um, so, yeah, that, that's part of the problem. Um, people don't... Uh, yeah, th- there's also obviously a question of funding yeah. uh, in many, many places, which prevents people really... You know, people being educated in general 
and then a lack of concern with with history, with culture, with these kinds of things. So that that's can that can be a bit of a problem. And then the other thing sometimes is that there's also a, a kind of legacy of colonialism and Eurocentric thinking about history as well. So there, there are lots of difficulties that you know people have to overcome in Africa. And then the other thing is that people there's a lack of funding for archives and for keeping papers and other things in good condition. And people don't necessarily know what's around. I remember years ago speaking at uh, Unilag in, in Lagos about West African Students' Union and speaking to all these professors and various people. And somebody asked me, where did you get all this information? I said, well, it's downstairs underneath this building in the archives, and they didn't even know where it was. So there are, lo there are lots of problems and difficulties. And obviously... In many African countries, people are dealing with, you know, all sorts of problems. Just a problem of, we take Nigeria, just a problem of literacy itself is a major problem, let alone people studying history. So there are lots of things that are on people's minds and, uh, you know, very, very difficult problems to solve, as well as understanding, teaching, learning about history. That's a real shame, though, you know, I mean, like, um, it's like, People out in America, people out in Europe, and wherever else we are, we can kind of, even though a lot of people don't read too much into African history here, but the, we have we have got like a number of researchers. You know, it's like I say in Africa. I'm not saying we don't have researchers, but it seems like the focus is on other things. Um, yeah, you know. we don't have that many researchers here. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we set up the Young Historians Project to train, encourage young people to take up history, because we don't really have that many people who are researching history in, in Britain. That's yeah. a big problem. I mean, on an independent route, um, like myself, I just started like traveling to all around different places in the world, I was connected with the original indigenous peoples, trying to, trying to find out a connection of black melanated peoples around the world. And I see it now. I'm not trying to identify put us all in one bracket, but I see that we're more people of nature wherever we go. In, in because I've visited the most secluded areas in Asia, Australia, Pacific, all around different places. So I see we have a common struggle, you know, and we're dealing with the, a common enemy and everything. So what what I always try to look at is is um. How are we going to, like, um, not just overcome oppression, but be able to raise our self-esteem higher to show people the great things that we did rather than just what we went through? And, you know, we have, we're strong people. We're still here. We're still going. But um, Africa, the big, massive, giant continent, it's, um, I don't know, sometimes, is it waiting for us? To connect, or is it, or are we waiting for Africa, or is it should be a double standard? It's a well, it should be both. I mean, it should be both. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, uh, I think my I talked about the study that I did years and years ago. I mean, that really showed me that the history of Africa and the African diaspora is one. It's one history, and people go backwards and forwards and influence each other, and so on. So, um. You know, Africa is, uh, well, let's put it this way. Africans are, we can say, our own liberators. So we need yeah. to liberate ourselves wherever we are, whether we're in Africa, we're in Britain, we're in wherever. People need liberation and to become decision makers in their own country. And one of the things we have in common whether we're in Britain or the US or the Caribbean or Africa, is we're not decision makers. Other people make the decisions. Yeah. So we need to find ways, systems, ways of becoming the decision makers and those who determine what happens in the world. Yeah. When we do that, we're in a position to solve all these kind of problems. Now, I'm more of a pan Africanist than a black nationalist. Mm -hmm. Now, um, can you see, can you identify the two different things? I'm sure you can. Yes, because I've spoke to some people and they, they, they're totally for black nationalism. So you could deal with the nation of Islam. Um, you could deal with 
certain certain groups that's more support black nationalism than more pan Africanism. I mean, you see pan Africanism in my, in my of my view, I believe it's the way to liberate liberate us globally. Now, what do you think of like black nationalism as far as should we like should people identify to try and of course build with whatever you are, but we are we've got to understand who's ruling over us when we deal with things like black nationalism. Well, I'm not sure I'd look at it in that way. I mean, I think people should do like Malcolm X said by any means necessary. So yeah, what yeah. other means that are necessary? Was Malcolm X a black nationalist or a pan-Africanist? Well, he was both. Both, that's right. He was one of the cards. Oh, okay, he was one so, of the but the issue is um, how do people, how do we liberate ourselves? And you have to look at the particular problems that are faced in this country or in Nigeria or wherever it happens to be. And the, the key thing about those countries is it's the same economic and political systems that exist in those countries. It's just the same capital-centered system. And if you look at the greatest Pan-African Congress that was ever held, or the most famous was the Manchester Congress in 1945, and the key things that were said at that Congress was that to develop an Africa where um, without colonial boundaries, without the colonial political system and without the capital-centered economic system. And that still remains the kind of uh, the goal, if you like, for African, Africa, Africa as, a, as a continent. How to develop a new Africa which is not under the kind of legacy of colonial rule and so on. So, uh, and a big part of that are, is the capital-centered economic system where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And that's the same in Nigeria, South Africa, Britain, Jamaica, the US, wherever you want to go. So how do you get rid of that system? That's the key. That's you can be a black nationalist, a pan-Africanist, Nation of Islam, Seventh-day Adventist, Church oh, of England, Pentecostalist, atheist, yeah, whatever. You still live under that system. So, yeah, true so, do, so do other people who are not even black. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, to me, those are the that's the key thing that has to be looked at. How do you unite all those people? And going back to the Manchester Congress, that was the thing that they looked at then. You know, they said. Uh, you know, subject peoples of the world unite. Yeah. Uh, Arabs and Jews unite against British imperialism. They understood that there was like one humanity and one struggle. People in different places have different particular different problems. Um, you know, the Palestinians have one problem, people in Africa have another problem, people in Britain another problem. But the, in that sense, the enemy is the same enemy because yeah. it's the Governments of Britain, the governments of the US, the government of Israel, they're all one. They're one. Now, here's another interesting thing as well. When speaking of Malcolm X before, now, what I find is, especially in the States, and obviously it spreads, when they wanted to give up their slave names, well, some of them, and they went to the Nation of Islam. Now, what they did is obviously took on an Arabic name. Now, yeah, maybe they consider themselves okay. halfway there. Why not an African name? <laughs> Why not? The African name is, I mean, especially now that you can go on the internet and find millions of different African names, whether they're from any tribe or any country, beautiful African names. But can you see... Um, if you, if you think Arabic, Arabic is derived from an African root, then you say that Arabic, oh, yeah, yeah. Arabic yeah, is an African yeah. language too. That's true. That's true. Now, where's an interesting since you brought this up, yeah, because I'm very aware of this. But... The people who live on the land of Arabia or uh, Arabians of the diaspora, they don't seem to see things like this. They seem to claim it as their own, and we join them, if you get what I'm saying. I find racism within the Arab world as well as the European world. Well, there's racism in every world. There's racism in the African world. Isn't what happened in Rwanda racism? Isn't what happens in South Africa where they attack people from other African countries? Isn't that racism? There's racism everywhere. Racism is racism. Yeah, yeah. 
No, but I, I look at obviously with racism though, you've got to have some sort of power. So when we're dealing with South Don't Africa, don't you think what happened in Rwanda was racism? To who you the two T's are you talking about the time of which which period of time in Rwanda? Yeah. Between the so-called Tutsis and the so-called Hutu, isn't that racism? Well, it's black on black, isn't it? But isn't it racism? Well, how can we be racist to each other? I mean, like, I don't you, you mean if you if you call other people, uh, if you designate other people as being different from you and other than you, and a different race than you, a different species from you, who can be exterminated, isn't that racism? Yeah, but who? Isn't there, the bad, isn't, there, the isn't there putting uh, Jewish people in concentration camps and killing them? Isn't that racism? Oh, of course. That's well, of it. course, of course. But but what I mean, the deal with Africa and before colonizers came in and infiltrated, divided us all up. You know, even like we were saying before with the tribe thing, we were more united, more on the one. I'm not saying it was perfect. Yeah, maybe. I don't know whether that's the case. I mean, people fought against each other. Yeah, people had yeah. wars against each other. People enslaved each other. People conquered each other. Yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> we get the no, point. It's anyway. not quite as simple. Yeah. It's not quite yeah, simple. Yeah. yeah. But um, I've enjoyed this discussion. I mean, we've come near to the end anyway, but I'd like to get a part two one time sometime soon. So I want to thank you very much, Hakim Adi. You're very welcome anytime. You take uh, it thank in. Thank you very much. It's James the Bowen, the Scovenant, dedicated to original peoples, and you'll have to do a part two because very interesting discussion. No problem. Anytime, just let me know. I'm going to have to rush off to my next meeting. I've just come from one meeting. I've got to go to another meeting now. So I'm going to disappear. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time. And you